Welcome, future doctors, to another episode of the Future Minority Doctor Podcast with Dr. Sulma and Marina, where we bring you conversations to empower and inspire you to contribute to your community and the world by becoming a doctor. Welcome, everyone. Today, I have a special guest, Melissa Gonzalez. Melissa is from Southern California and is currently living in Los Angeles, where she is about to begin her second year of medical school. She is the daughter of two Mexican immigrants and the first to go to college in her family. Melissa received her Bachelor's of Art in Psychology with a minor in Art from Georgetown University in 2018. Outside of school, Melissa enjoys running, painting, and photography. Melissa is passionate about mentorship and encouraging other first-generation students to pursue higher education and or medical school. She shares pre-med tips and her experience in medical school on her Instagram page at browngirl underscore white coat. I love following you on Instagram, Melissa. I really like to see your journey and your inspirational tips and motivational quotes and all of that. So I encourage everyone to follow you if they can. Again, it's at brown girl underscore white coat. All right. Well, welcome, Melissa, to the podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. We want to hear a little bit about your story, um, and hopefully some of our listeners can be inspired um, from aspects of your story. First of all, tell us about where you are in medical school. What is your experience right now? Yeah, like you said, I'm about to start my second year of medical school in about a month. So we're currently on summer break, which is really nice. And living in LA and just really enjoying this experience, something that I've, I've looked forward to almost all my life. And so to be here right now, I'm always really grateful and humbled by that. Excellent. I'm sure other people who are maybe aspiring to go to medical school are wondering or wonder at times, what is it actually like to be a medical student? Obviously, you've just finished your first year and every year is a little bit different. But what was your first year like for you? Yeah, you know, the first year was really nice. Most of it's just lectures and some clinical exposure when we go to the hospital or a clinic once a week. And so that was really nice. That was like the one in-person thing we could do this pandemic and everything else was online. So that was a bummer. Making friends was very difficult, but it was nice to have that time in the hospital or with patients because it reminded us in the midst of all the studying and like the stress of, of learning all the material that like in the future, we're going to be doing this and we're going to be caring for for patients and people. And, and that was I think one of the most um, impactful moments of like my year is spending time with patients and getting to know them. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Was it really hard for you? Like, was it a hard adjustment in terms of the rigor of the classes, of the hours of studying, the multiple tests, I'm sure? How was that adjustment for you? Yeah, I was really nervous going into med school. I almost spent the year that I was applying in anticipation, I was like preparing myself mentally for the rigor and just like expecting the absolute worst. Because in college, I was not prepared for the rigor. And I, you know, I did well in high school. And I was like, okay, I can do well in college. And then you get there. And I was just like, oh, man, I'm not as smart as I like thought I was. So I kind of wanted to make sure that I had, you know, the right mindset going to med school, expecting very difficult classes and material to learn. And while it was difficult, I think having the right mindset helped. I think it made the difference for me. Kind of having a bad experience in college academically, I knew that I had to, you know, go in there with like a different mindset and different perspective. And it's, I'd say med school is difficult, but it's not impossible. And I think I had to remind myself that too, because I think, you know, people mention, you know, it's like, drinking water from a fire hose. And it kind of is. But if you think about it, you know, drinking water from a fire hose is probably like impossible. It's probably not like you're not humans aren't able to do that, I don't think. And so I think that analogy is like not the most accurate because people get through med school. Um, It might be difficult, but it's possible. And that's what I always like try to remind myself that Others can do it and I can do it. And so can anyone else who like puts their mind to it. Yeah, that's an excellent point. We do use that phrase a lot uh, in describing yeah. medical school, but you're totally right. It's not impossible. It is it is doable if you work hard. So let's backtrack a little bit. Tell us a little bit about your upbringing, your background. What motivated you to become a doctor? Yeah, I have this little plaque from preschool that uh, my parents still keep around. And it's, you know, it was about me. And it's like, you know, my name's Melissa. I'm five years old. I want to be a doctor when I grow up. 
and my favorite game is hide and seek. So like even in preschool, I was five and I already knew I wanted to be a doctor. And I think that came from hearing my parents' stories coming from Mexico. They were in like rural towns of Sinaloa and it was, they didn't have access to the best healthcare. And my mom especially was like more in like the mountain area. And so seeing a doctor was pretty difficult. And so as a kid, I grew up hearing that. And I just thought to myself, well, wouldn't it just be easy for like me to be a doctor and just go down there in the future and help people there? And that's kind of where it started. And of course, I was a kid. So over the years, I thought about different things. Like there's a point where I want to be an architect and an and a, uh, astronaut, you know, like those things. But medicine always like stuck with me over the years. And that was always something I went back to. And so, yeah, that was kind of where it started, you know, hearing my parents' stories. And just at the time, you know, I didn't realize how difficult it was to become a doctor. And I was a kid. So I was like, yeah, you know, doctor, cool. They help people and they care for people. And that's like what I really wanted to do. So, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you have any exposure to the healthcare field as a kid or as a teenager, like anyone in your family or anyone in your neighborhood that was in healthcare? Um, not growing up until, um, so it's kind of a long story, but my mom, she worked at a gas station for 13 years, like the first, you know, 10 years of my life. Uh, she was at a gas station, the gas station was sold and it was going to be shut down. And so she needed a new job. And she, you know, she tells a story of that last day she was working. She went into the gas station bathroom. She like knelt on her knees and prayed and said, like, what am I going to do? Like, what job am I going to have after this? Um, And she was really worried. And, you know, she went back to the gas station to serve the customers and the medical, the director of the free clinic in our hometown, um, he stepped in to get his like his drink of the day. And he's like, hey, like, what, what's happening on the shelves are empty. And she's like, well, we're closing. And he said, well, what are you going to do? And she's like, well, I don't know. And he said, well, we, we need some like Spanish speaking help at the clinic. Do you want to come help us out? And she was like, mm, I'm not qualified for this. I have like no education. She had, you know, up to middle school education in Mexico. And so she was really intimidated by it. But she went and she loved it there. And so she spent 15 years at the clinic you know, got her GED while she was there, became a medical assistant. And so I would go there every day after school. And well, my dad was working and he would come pick me up after, but it was there where I was like, whoa, like there's these doctors and like, there's these nurses and very nice volunteers that would, you know, ask me, Hey, you want to come shadow me? Like, you know, come see what I'm doing with this patient. I was like, sure. And so that's kind of how the idea of becoming a doctor really solidified. Uh, And when I began to know more about like the ins and outs of like applying to med school and um, what it meant to like be a doctor, like a practicing doctor. So that was, I think, just life changing for me. Um, And I'm super grateful for the opportunity at the free clinic. That's wonderful. And thanks for sharing that story. That's pretty touching story of your mom being, you know, just in the right place at the right time to get that opportunity. And yeah, that's wonderful that you had that exposure, because that really helps in terms of understanding what this career is really about, um, getting to see all of those um, neat opportunities to help people in a variety of ways. So that's great that you had that. You mentioned during college, you went to Georgetown University. You said you did really well in high school and that college was a little bit of a shock. It was a little difficult. I can definitely relate to that. <laughs> I went to a, yeah. an Ivy League school and oh man, man, it kicked my butt. So tell me yeah. a little bit more about that experience. What exactly happened in college? How did you figure things out along the way? Well, I think that was the main issue is that I didn't have friends or family that had gone through that experience. And so I was kind of going in there very blind. And uh, I didn't know anything about like the right amount of credits to take, what was like the typical, you know, amount of studying kids do. And, you know, I, I made the mistake of, I took, I think, 19 or 20 credits my first semester. And, you know, I was surprised that that was approved. And that was like the, my main issue. My first semester, I was not prepared for that, that many credits of work. And also just like the rigor of it, it was nothing compared to my public high school back home. And so a lot of my classmates at Georgetown come from very privileged backgrounds and, you know, from private boarding schools I'd never heard of in my life. And so that was a big shock, like culturally as well. Um, and I think it was just a new, it was like just a whole new world for me coming from Southern California and moving all the way to DC. And I love DC and that's why I really wanted to go to, to, to school there, but it was just very different, you know, culturally. And that took some getting used to, and I wasn't aware that I could, 
you know, get help. I didn't, I wasn't used to asking for help growing up. You know, my, I could never ask my parents for school work help. And I kind of managed to do all that on my own for most of my life. And then when I get to college, that wasn't enough for me. And so I had to learn to be okay with like asking for help. And that was also like a big learning experience for me. And I think it was good because it opened my eyes to like, you know, what I needed to do to be successful. And in the future, it helped. But, you know, the idea of going to office hours and speaking to a professor one on one was very scary for me. And it took a long time for me to, you know, get the courage to do that. And that's, you know, what I I tell a lot of like pre-meds right now, like that's so important is just like asking for help when you need it. And also not being scared of, you know, reaching out and going to professor office hours, because that's when like, academically things got better for me. And that was a a very important lesson. Mm -hmm. Thanks for mentioning that too. We have a whole episode on the topic of asking for help because it is such a common problem that especially first generation students run into. Mm -hmm. You just don't come from the background, you know, you don't have parents necessarily that went to college and nobody tells you these things. And so you get there. And I think there's also some fear involved because at least for me, I was afraid of being judged negatively if I asked Mm -hmm. a question or admitted that I didn't understand something. But I think the longer you're in college, the more you realize that you're not alone. Like even these kids coming from you know, more privileged backgrounds, they have questions too. They don't understand things. But the difference Mm -hmm. is that they've learned to be comfortable asking questions and asking for help. Exactly. Whereas sometimes we just didn't grow up that way or we just weren't trained in that. So to everyone listening, please, please, please get comfortable asking for help. It takes practice. It's terrifying in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Uh, But the more you do it, the more comfortable it'll become. Yeah, exactly. Um, Yeah. Did you have a mentor during college um, that really helped you throughout the process, especially throughout the process of applying to medical school? Yeah. In college, I was in a program called the Georgetown Scholarship Program, and they tried their best. It was like for first generation students, um, low income students at Georgetown, and they tried their best to pair us up with mentors that could help us out. It wasn't until I think my junior year that I was paired with a physician in the community and she was really helpful in terms of giving me advice and like extracurriculars that I should be doing or, you know, how to prepare for med school. But she was also like very far removed from the med school application process because she's been a physician for many years. And so that part of it wasn't as helpful, but like the encouragement was there and she was very much like willing to, you know, um, have me over to shadow her and encourage me to do those types of activities. And I also was able to connect with like a dean at my school who ended up retiring after I graduated, but he wasn't as discouraging as other deans. And so he would, I would go to his office and say, hey, like, well, maybe I'll go to PA school. And he's like, are you sure you want to do that? Like, you know, you've wanted to be a doctor for so long. And so he was kind of someone that I would like bounce off these ideas when I was, even in college, I was questioning if med school was still a possibility for me after having a rough start. And so those two people were very helpful in college. When I graduated, I took two years before I started med school. And that's when I kind of applied and I studied for the MCAT. And I was lucky enough to connect with a physician at the free clinic. His wife is also a physician and she really likes writing and enjoys that aspect and of applications. And she's like, hey, like I could, you know, read over your personal statement and give you some tips. And she was beyond helpful. I, I don't think I could have gone into med school without her. She really, you know, would we would call each other on the phone for like an hour just going over through these edits. And I think that was really, really helpful for me because I'm not the best writer. And so English was always my worst subject. And she really helped me like bring out like my story and like in a very effective and meaningful way. And that was just, yeah, beyond like life changing. I think I, I would not have gone into med school without her, I think. Do you have any tips or maybe other pre-med students that find themselves needing someone to help them either as a mentor during college or in the application process itself? Yeah, I think uh, while you're in college, definitely asking upperclassmen uh, who are pre-med or there's also a lot of, at least at my school, we had these kind of med school pre-med mentor relationships. So they would pair us up with a med student at the med school and you know, the, those are the kinds of relationships that you kind of get what you make out of, make out of it. So I um, had a mentor and I tried to meet up with her a few times a year, even though she was really busy in med school. And she was also very nice in helping me prepare for like interviews. I was applying to like a 
summer program. And so she really was helpful in that regard. And so I, I think just reaching out and seeing if there's a med school on your campus and seeing if there's already an existing program. And if not, like maybe starting one, that'd be a really cool initiative to begin. And then when you're applying to med school, I think, honestly, I've seen a lot of growth in like social media and med students encouraging students on there and like helping out with essays. I, if someone messages me on Instagram and says, hey, can you read over my personal statement? And I say, yeah, sure, send it over. And I will caution against paying for these services because I think there's a lot of that going around. And I'm not sure that's the necessary. I was almost trapped into that myself, paying like thousands of dollars for this like med school, like, you know, advice and they guaranteed an admission. I don't think that's possible. So don't fall trap. Like I almost did to that. But there's lots of people on social media that are willing to give you free advice and, you know, help you out with your personal statements and secondaries. And also, you know, I've also been able to make some connections on med Twitter is what they call it, I guess, you know, on Twitter, these physicians and med students and pre-meds, they'll ask a question and people are so nice in, in responding. And that's also a good, good place to find some advice. And usually, you know, I always say never pay for mentorship because that's not really being a mentor, right? So that's my biggest advice. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, that's great advice. And I think you're totally right. There's so much information now through like social media. People have YouTube channels. I've seen yeah. pre-meds have uh, YouTube channels and med students about their experiences. There's also, I think they do offer like services that you have to pay for, but med school headquarters, I think they're called with Ryan Gray. He has a lot of podcasts and he has a free YouTube channel yeah. that actually walks um, walks you through like the whole AMCAS application for different students. Some people have like really good grades and really good numbers and scores, but they didn't necessarily get into med school. Some people have lower numbers, lower grades, but they did. So it's really helpful to kind of see the whole application what it's going to look like in advance and some of the pitfalls to avoid. So, but yeah, your point is well taken. Lots of free resources out there. So don't feel trapped into feeling like you have to pay thousands of dollars for advice. <laughs> like you said. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Looking back at your college education, your college years, are there other things besides, like you mentioned, learning to ask for help? Are there other things that you wish you had done to prepare yourself better for applying to medical school and for medical school and maybe advice that you would have for other students? Yeah, I think the big one for me was asking for help, but also just believing in myself because I struggled a lot with like imposter syndrome and I think a lot of us do. And that's where a lot of the questioning came from. And it's like, can I really do this? I'm not sure. And so it really took a while for me to like be confident. And to be honest, I wasn't really confident until I got into med school, like all through the application season, I was so worried. I was thinking of like plan B's and like what I'd have to do if I didn't get in. And I think it's just believing in yourself is really important, as cheesy as it sounds. And I was really lucky to have parents who were very positive about the whole thing. So they kind of kept me grounded. But partially, I think because they didn't realize how hard it was to get in. (laughs) They're just generally positive people. But I think that's something I really wish I would have been better at in college because I spent a lot of time just not thinking that I could do it. And that probably also affected like my academic performance, just, you know, got in the way of, you know, my test taking, you know, skills and um, all of that. Try to think if there's anything else. Yeah. I think those are two, the two big ones for me, at least. I can't think of anything else that would have been good to have. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, believing in yourself is a huge, huge, huge one. <laughs> I think just a yeah. lot of us, you know, because, because we, Some of us come from families where, you know, we didn't have uh, parents who even went to college or family members that are in professional careers. It's just really hard to see ourselves succeeding because we don't see many other people around us having succeeded. Mm -hmm. But just because we don't see those examples all the time around us, it doesn't mean that we're not just as capable as anybody else. But it is a huge barrier you mentioned that you didn't really feel that confidence until you got into med school. Was that sort of a validating experience? Like, oh my gosh, I I can do this. Yeah, it, it was. I still remember the day I was I was at Starbucks and I was just like doing some work. I was, I was doing some part time like remote work, and so I got there and like five minutes after sitting down, I got a call from like the area code of the school, and I was just like, oh my gosh, this could be good, maybe bad, and. You know, the dean was like, hey, you know, we loved you at the interview day. Like we, you know, congrats on your acceptance. And I just immediately called my dad. We were like both crying. I had to like run out of Starbucks. Um, and um, yeah. And so 
it was just, yeah, it felt like, wow, somebody like saw, saw me as something other than just, you know, my GPA was very low applying to med school. And so that was like the big, like, mm-hmm. you know, quote unquote red flag for me. And so I just kind of felt like, you know, these admissions people saw me as something other than just a number. And they like saw that I was, you know, just someone that could, you know, be at their med school and like be successful. And that was extremely validating. And it was like my dream school too. And so I was just like, wow, like this is just, it was beyond unbelievable, you know? And so it, my parents were even like, wait, like, are you sure you got the call? Like, can we see the, the on your phone? And I was like, oh my gosh, uh-huh. don't make me like think that I just made this up. But it did feel like that for a while because I didn't right. get the email with like the acceptance for like a few days. And I was like, wow, okay, so this is real. Um, But yes, that was extremely validating and probably one of the, the best memories that I, I think I'll have, especially like, you know, just experiencing that with my parents. And that was very, uh, it was very nice. Yeah. What a wonderful moment. Yeah. that It's such a thrill for anybody, <laughs> wherever you get an acceptance <laughs> letter, it is such a thrill after so much work, so many years, so much mm-hmm. hope, so much effort. Um, yeah. I do appreciate that you mentioned, you know, that one of your challenges was that, that low GPA. And I think a lot of students, especially if you struggle to adjust to college, you struggle to ask Mm -hmm. for help, you struggle to believe in yourself, all of these factors influence your GPA and your ability to get good grades and be competitive. But, you know, I love that you're an example of someone that despite having maybe a lower GPA, obviously you were able to demonstrate to an admissions committee that you have what it takes. They probably looked at other things too. They looked at the trend of your GPA over the, the four years. Mm-hmm. They looked at your MCAT score. They looked at your extracurricular activities, your letters of recommendation. So uh, you know, for our listeners, please keep that in mind. Don't feel like a low GPA is you know, automatically not going to get to a spot because you can <laughs> get yeah. in. Depends, exactly. of course, on the exact number. You know, Your chances go down the lower it is. But you know, I had a similar situation. I, you know, my grades were pretty low the first one or two years. And then I was able to Mm -hmm. show that trend upward. I was able to get a competitive MCAT score as well. What about the MCAT for you? Do you feel like that helped you out? Or what was the experience? Like we had a couple of episodes recently on how to succeed in the MCAT. So uh, how did you prepare? What was the (laughs) secret to your success with the MCAT? I knew that the MCAT would be so important with my low GPA that it could, you know, maybe balance that out for me. And so I really tried and focus on studying and doing well in the exam. And so during my gap year, my first gap year, I enrolled in a prep course called the Berkeley Review, and it's just like local to me. And I'd heard really good things about the instructors. And thankfully, my scholarship program at my undergrad school gave us, gave the pre-meds a scholarship as we graduated. So I was able to use that money to pay for this this program. Otherwise, I'm not sure if I would have been able to afford it. But uh-huh. it was really nice having that structured time and in, in class and getting just like those little tips that they suggested. And I just tried to study every day. And I think the biggest advice I would give is just practice questions is like the biggest, you know, help in studying for the MCAT. I think I personally got too caught up in like reviewing concepts and sometimes that feels good to like be reviewing things but it's not until you're actually testing yourself that you realize like what you know and what you don't know so I definitely wish I would have uh-huh. taken more practice exams but you know I, I took the exam I studied October through January and took the exam got a 508 and I was like okay that's close enough to a 510 that's like I think average matriculant MCAT scores uh, nationwide so I was uh-huh. like okay I think that'll be okay I don't want to risk having to take it again pay again and study more. So I just yeah. um, accepted that score and I was pretty happy with it. Uh huh. Yeah. And, and I mean, that is a very decent score. It's not easy to get a 508. <laughs> it takes a lot of work, a lot of preparation. So that's great that, that you were able to do that. Now tell me a little bit about your gap years. You mentioned that you had, I believe, two gap years between finishing college and medical school. How did you fill that time? Yeah. And what, what did that time look like for you? Yeah, it was kind of a mix of things. I was working two part-time jobs. One was through the free clinic that I grew up at. They were actually starting a capital campaign for a new building and they needed just like an assistant. And like, I have no idea what capital campaigns entail, but I was just kind of doing like the, you know, emails and papers and stuff like that. So that was really nice work. Um, And a lot of it could be done remotely. So I could also study for the MCAT. And then my other uh, Mm -hmm. job, part-time job was a remote marketing assistant 
job with a small sunscreen company based in New York. And that was just a connection I made through the scholarship program. I was an undergrad and they were looking for like a marketing assistant that could just help with their social media and stuff like that. So that was just like really fun and exciting work that I could just do on the side and keep me busy and get a, you know, a small income, which was really helpful. And then I also, I didn't take physics in undergrad. It wasn't, didn't have the best reputation at my school. So I kind of just figured I'd take it once I moved back home at a local school here. And so I did that over the summer. And then I focused on preparing for the MCAT. And after the MCAT, I spent that spring of 2019 working on my application, starting my personal statement and pre-writing secondaries. And so that, that following year was just mostly filled with me working and applying to med school and, you know, going to interviews and stuff like that. Yeah. So um, if I understand correctly, you applied to medical school once, is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Gotcha. What do you think was the most challenging part of the application process for you personally? I think for me, it was definitely writing a personal statement and conveying like my story in a way that like would be memorable because I think there's so many people applying and you have to stand out some way. And I think for me, my low GPA, my kind of below average MCAT score, there had to be something that was just memorable for the admissions committee. And so that was the, my biggest worry and like my biggest source of stress, I think for me. Other, other than that, I think most parts of the application are not as stressful for me, at least in my experience. And then also just interview season, I think preparing for them, especially MMIs, like I'd never even heard of that until like a few years before applying to med school uh-huh. and it just like was terrifying. I was like, how do you prepare for this? You have no idea what's going to come at you. And that was also yeah. very stressful. And so I w- tried to watch YouTube videos and read this book that someone recommended. And, you know, I, I had, I went to two MMI interviews and they were fine. You know, they're kind of fun actually. And people tell, would tell me that. And I was like, how could you, how could that be fun? And you leave and you're like, okay, that was kind of fun. So definitely preparing for the interviews was, um, yeah. Yeah. For some of our listeners who don't know what MMIs are, can you describe them briefly? Yeah, it just stands for multiple mini interviews. And it's basically, you know, different stations that you go to these rooms. And some of the rooms could be just a general interview question like you would normally expect. Others I had were like role playing stations. So I would go in there and there'd be a situation and there'd be actors in there, very good actors. And there'd be somebody watching your interaction with this actor and seeing how you respond to the situation that they gave you. And then there was also some stations about like teamwork. So I would go in there with another applicant and they'd have a puzzle or uh, something to build and they'd wanted to see how we were good at like communicating with each other and um, playing off each other and this like team based activity. That's kind of like what to expect in an MMI. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like to think of it as like speed dating interviews, right? Because I think they only give you like a couple yeah. of minutes for each one. You go to the first one, you know, then into the next one, then into the next one. Yeah, so um, every school does it a little differently. But yeah, it's an interesting interview process. I think schools used mm-hmm. to have more of a traditional interview where you just like pair up with two faculty members and you spend like 30 minutes to an hour just chatting with them. They get to know you, you get to know them. They ask you know, questions. Mm -hmm. But nowadays, more and more schools are doing the mini medical interviews, which is kind of more of a speed dating (laughs) process. But it is a little more, the argument is that it is a little more fair to applicants, because instead of just pairing you with like one or maybe two faculty members that could be, you know, maybe possibly biased in their own ways, you get a more of an even evaluation from like, six or eight different people. Yeah. I'm curious, Melissa, so now that you're in medical school, congratulations on finishing your first year. Do you you. have any idea what kind of doctor you want to be? Yeah, going into med school, a lot of my shadowing experiences were at the free clinic and that's all primary care. And I, you know, felt to push family medicine was, I think I felt like I could really make a connection with patients and, you know, family medicine, primary care and generally like the long-term care as a Spanish speaker as well. I thought that that could be impactful. You know, there's a lot of Spanish speaking patients at the free clinic and I would often be their interpreter. And I think it really made a difference for them to have somebody there that could understand their culture and their language. And so going into med school, I really thought primary care and I still, family medicine is in my top three right now, but I I also got getting to med school really opened my eyes, you know, getting all these guest lectures and, and, you know, I've been thinking maybe dermatology as well. Um, psychiatry. I was a psych major in college. And so that's also interesting to me. 
Uh -huh. um, but really keeping my mind open because, I mean, we haven't done any shadowing yet because of the pandemic. So now that we're allowed to shadow mm -hmm. starting the summer, I've kind of started to reach out and see if I could get more experience in fields that are not family medicine because I have had so much experience with that. And I know it's like already like an interest. And so we'll see if any of these others, you know, continue to be interesting to me um, as I, you know, learn more about them and shadow doctors. But yeah, we'll see. I, I'm definitely mm -hmm. not leaning towards surgery. I will say that. <laughs> I don't think I, uh -huh. I can do surgery. Okay, fair so. enough. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, who knows? You know, you go into third year, yeah. you, maybe you're going to fall in love with it. Who knows? But, who <laughs> but knows? it's good to keep an open mind yeah. because, you know, we, we obviously do need a lot more Latino, Hispanic and other uh, underrepresented minority physicians within primary care. There's a huge need, but it's not the only need. We need underrepresented minority physicians in all specialties. So whatever mm -hmm. you end up, you know, liking and feeling is a good fit for you. We need you. So I wanted yeah, to bring up you. a little bit more about your social media. You're very active on social media with your account. You try to inspire others. I think you mentioned to me that you started your social media accounts and posting during the application process. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? What inspired you to get a social media following and share parts of your story through there? Yeah, I think I kind of mentioned just it, it would have been nice for me personally to like see somebody else who had similar struggles, who maybe was also first gen or, you know, had a lower GPA and could give me some guidance and reassurance that like it is possible. And just that exposure, I think is really nice for like pre-meds to see that there is a wide range in personalities and life experiences in med students in general. So I think seeing that would, would have really opened my eyes when I was applying to med school and made me feel a little bit more confident. And I, I mentioned I struggled with that applying. And just, I think also... I had such a bad experience with my college pre-med advisors. Um, and I think that tends to be a common experience in a lot of pre-meds, especially first-gen pre-meds or URMs. And I wanted to talk about that and just share that, you know, hey, I kind of believed my pre-med advisors at first. And I, you know, I decided not to go to med school after my first year of college. But then I realized that it was something I had really wanted to do. And so advising is not telling a student you can't do it. It's like helping them and guiding them along the way so that they can reach their goals. And so I really wish I had an advisor that that was um, supportive in that way. So I just wanted to, especially on the my Instagram account, just to share that I had this bad experience, but even though, though these pre-med advisors didn't believe that I could get into med school, I did. And I, I emailed them after I got accepted to a couple of schools. And I was like, hey, just letting you know, like I got into my dream school and, you know, just maybe think about changing your pre-med advising techniques or how you work with students, because it's obviously possible, even if I did have low GPA that you guys consider was impossible to get into med school. Um, they did not respond, but mm -hmm. I just felt really nice to share uh -huh. that with them. And just hopefully maybe they'll change their ways of, of advising, because that was, I think, a big factor in my, my not so nice pre-med experience in college. <laughs> Yeah. Unfortunately, like you mentioned, I think that's not a completely unique experience. There are a lot of students that get discouraged along the way by pre-medical advisors or other academic advisors. And I think it's because, you know, they themselves are not doctors. They haven't mm -hmm. themselves gone through the process. And so I think there tends to be too much of a focus on the numbers game, right? And so if they see yeah. a student with a lower GPA or maybe just, you know, their unconscious biases that we all hold. Mm -hmm. um, and so those things can contribute to getting less than perfect advice. So thank you for sharing mm -hmm. that. I think, you know, if any of our listeners, if you are getting that kind of advice, please take it with a grain of salt. <laughs> um, yeah, use, exactly. you know, use us as examples of people who did not have the best numbers and still we persevere. You have to have perseverance. You have to work hard. You have to have grit. You have mm -hmm. to be willing to, you know, uh, work hard to get a good NCAT score to offset that GPA or do a post-bac program. Different people mm -hmm. do different things, but you can get into medical school, so don't give up. And I'm glad that you emailed yes. those advisors. I love that <laughs> um, because even if they didn't reply, that message was probably heard <laughs> and maybe there was yeah. a little bit of humility involved, hopefully. And going hopefully. forward, hopefully they, they might do things a little differently as well. Regarding yeah. your social media accounts, have you gotten positive feedback from people who follow you? What has that experience been like? Yeah, I, you know, I get some you know, direct messages on my Instagram of pre-med students who are like, thank you so much for like sharing this or sharing your MCAT score or 
how your pre-med experience was because I'm struggling through the same exact thing. And um, it's just really encouraging to see that. And so getting those messages is really nice. And that's kind of why I started the, the page in the first place. And so it's nice to hear from these students and hear that it's been helpful to them. And also mm-hmm. I get messages saying like, hey, I'm, I'm in a sim- similar situation as a pre-med. Can I call you or can we Zoom or can we talk on the phone to, to see how um, I can maybe improve and better prepare myself for med school? And every single person that's asked me, I'm like, yes, please. Like I'm, you know, if I have the time, I will, you know, Zoom with you or be, get on the phone with you and see how I can better help you and maybe give you some answers to some of your questions. And I think that's been also really nice to be able to connect with these students because it would have been so helpful to have that when I was applying. And so I try my best to make Uh time for that. That's wonderful. I love that you're doing that. And you are inspiring more people than you even realize, I'm sure, because a lot of people, you know, they see you, but they don't necessarily send messages. Um, And Mm -hmm. I'm sure you're having a a really positive influence. (laughs) Any last words of advice, anything that you want to say to other pre-meds that are on their own journey trying to get into medical school? Yeah, I think the biggest advice that, again, that I wish I would have had is just you can do it. And there's many different paths to medical school. And when I first went to college, I didn't realize that. I kind of just knew the typical normal path to medical school after graduating college, no gap years. And and that was all I've seen and heard. And then I got to med school and realized that oh, post back programs exist, or, you know, some students go and get a, a master's degree, and um, whatever it takes to get into med school. And the biggest advice I got from one of my um, upperclassmen med school mentors in college, she, she applied to med school a few times. And she said, you know, med school is always going to be there. It's not going away anywhere. <laughs> you know, it's, it's there. And so if it uh-huh. takes a couple years extra to get there, then it's, it's no big deal. You know, you're going to be a physician either way. So I think that really opened my eyes and realizing that if I needed to take some extra time, that it's okay. And it's actually normal, you know, gap years are so common these days. So definitely realize that your path doesn't have to be like somebody else's and there's strength to that. So I think definitely reminding yourself that it's okay to not take the typical path. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love that. Thank you so much, Melissa. Thank you for taking the time today. Um, Again, to our listeners, please, if you want to follow Melissa, her Instagram handle is at browngirl underscore white coat. Is that correct, Melissa? Yeah. 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 Okay. (laughs) Great. Yeah. And uh, thanks so much for taking the time to talk with me today and to share your story. I'm sure many will find it inspiring and helpful on their own journey. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Take care, everyone.